Oh no, it's another one of those trailers that everything starts with. I'd kind of hope that they would have given up on this because it, it is kind of irritating. Because some of these are not skippable. You can't just jump forward and get past this. There's only so many times that you want to sit there and watch this kind of thing. I guess they're not really concerned with the playability of the disc itself. It's really just a group of advertisements, isn't it? Jam an advertisement in the front. But, you know, just put this video in there and let people choose to watch it. I guess the people who made the game, Batman game here, wanted to make sure everyone watched it. And there's a lot of videos that I'm just not going to watch as a kid. I watched the Batman cartoon when I was a kid, and then I've watched the Batman movies, but I've never really called myself a big Batman fan. It was a PS2 game. Huh. You're not really getting a lot across. The games... PlayStation 1 disc here. And, of course, the only way that you're going to have a PlayStation 1 game, or rather a PlayStation 2 game and a PlayStation 1 disc is to show a video. But unfortunately, the PlayStation 1, although it did have some impressive video decoding abilities for its day, it doesn't really do PlayStation 2 justice. So, compression artifacts and all that kind of stuff just make uh, the whole thing look worse than it needs to. Okay, whatever the hell that was. Voltron fight, I guess. Mary Kate and Ashley crush course. Oh god, this is gonna be bad. Oh, my controller's not responding. Ah shit. There we go. It wasn't it didn't have focus. <laughs> the emulator didn't have focus. I did not read the instructions. I did not read a word of <laughs> that I'm expecting this to be just a complete load of shit. <laughs> the damn Olsen twins. Springboarded to fame by being the baby on Full House. And that show went on for too long. That show was crap. I mean, that show was garbage. And then, like, from wherever the hell... Oh, God, it's a... Mini-games. How the hell old were they when this happened? I don't want to look it up. <laughs> Jesus, look at this. All right. Uh. Whoa, you suck, Olsen twin. I gotta walk over there? You suck. Where the hell are you? Oh, conveyor belts. <laughs> <laughs> what is this place? <laughs> oh, the conveyor belt carries her along too. Is there a run button? Jeez, look how broad her shoulders are. <laughs> what? <laughs> Were you having a heart attack? Oh, no, I'm controlling it. That hole is huge. 
Okay. It's harder than it looks, clearly. Is it just mini golf or is there something else here? No, no, no. <laughs> We're not doing another one of these. What the hell did they really do? I mean, they were in a bunch of weird TV movies when they were kids. But... What the f... Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay, you slip on leaves, I guess? What is it? Seaweed? That turtle did a friggin' drop toe hold on you. Or that crab did. What's the turtle gonna do? Come on, turtle. Take her out. Oh, I collected the turtle. And and some beer. What? I can't get any more beer? Oh, this is a collecting game. Oh, okay. So I'm supposed to collect shit. There's a walk button. How do I collect? <laughs> Oh, I'm supposed to find things. So the horseshoe crab, no? It's actually leaving footprints. It's a small horseshoe crab. Those things are giant. Um, yeah, okay. Oh, am I supposed to collect the garbage? Drop the horseshoe crab in, the, the crabs in. I have two crabs now. I have one turtle and two crabs. And I'm running out of time. I've never felt so much stress in my life. Um, I've, I definitely got to pick up these damn beer cans. I have no camera control. Oh, there it is. <laughs> it's one of those ones where you push the shoulder button and it centers the camera. Oh, does it, oh wait, I thought there was a whole chunk of map over here I could get to. Pick up the damn bottle, you blonde dumbass. Alright, that's enough of this. <laughs> What's the last one? Uh, oh, it's one of these shooting gallery things. Yeah. Cool. Now this didn't, didn't cool. have anything to do with Full House, I guess. Cool. Because Full House was nice. definitely off the air by 01. Were they making movies at the time? Or were they... Uh, who cares? Alright, that's enough of this. Alright, let's get out of this. Oh, this is 2002, not 2001. I think this was a 2002. January 2002 disc. PlayStation 1 was still getting demo discs in 2002. There's always been the overlap when the old console is still hanging on when it's replacement. Like, there's a lot of talk about, like, oh, well, the, the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series something are out, and there's still PlayStation 4 and Xbox One games being released in a lot of games at cross-gen and all that. Well, the cross-gen thing is something a little bit more recent, but there's always been a case where the old console lingered on and the, um... And you just sort of 
continue to to get games for the old machine even though if the people who are early adopters and get to get the new machines kind of want everything to move forward better graphics better gameplay all that kind of stuff with the new machines but the old ones they i mean there's a market there for that i'm sure there was a lot at, in 2002 of people who have yet to upgrade to a playstation 2 wow look at this What is happening? I have a gun here. How do I fire it? Oh, shit. Oh, do I need to get a pickup? This is a weird racer. The emulator is giving it problems. It's running a tad slow. Oh, there's a missile. Oh, I didn't get it. This motherfucker did. You can jump. Oh, I'm a jet now. <laughs> I, I have no uh, verticality, though. I can't control. I can't pitch up or down. Honestly, this isn't too bad. I mean, I would not have paid any attention to this at the time, because I definitely had a PlayStation 2 by now. The last PlayStation 1 game, I would say I bought... Well, you no, know, I mean, that's not going to make any sense. The last new PlayStation 1 game I bought, because I bought a few PlayStation 1 games well after the generation had ended. What did, I, what, what, what did, what did I just do? There's a lot of PlayStation 1 games that I bought after the generation ended where, like, I went to GameStop or something like that, and... It, the cars keep changing. The last new PlayStation 1 game I bought was Final Fantasy IX. Oops. I fired... Well, I shot my load off. And really, that was kind of a special exception. It was a game that I'd kind of ignored. And I'm like, what am I doing? There's another. There's one of these games out, just because it's not for um, the newer system and just because I didn't like the art style. I went and gave it a try anyway. But there were plenty of PlayStation 1 games that I bought after the generation had ended that were... <laughs> Shoot them up, motherfuckers. Hey, like me now, bitch. Oh, nope, he flew up and knocked me aside. Well, anyway. The point I'm trying to make, and I keep wandering off of, is even if I had thought that this game kind of was a little bit of a cool concept, I'm definitely not going out and spending $40 on this shit. Simply because, I mean, I'm not huge in the racing games anyway. What? I'm not huge in the racing games anyway. And it, it is... It is a PlayStation 1 game in an era when I've been trying... every All the money I had, I would have been spending on PlayStation 2. Because, you know, that was the new hotness. Alright, let's see if I can find someone to shoot. Like this motherfucker. Bitch. But not everybody had the PS2. In fact, they were, they were a little difficult to find. Oh, he shot me up. They were a little difficult to find in the early days. I mean, I remember... I had the money saved up. What? I had the money saved up for a PS2. And I couldn't find one. I had tried reserving one prior to launch. And... I couldn't. Like everywhere I went, they wouldn't even they wouldn't even let me reserve one. And then after it launched, like every couple of weeks or so, I'd go around to the different um, stores and all that. It's like, yeah, do you have PlayStation 2s reserved? All that kind of stuff. 
Well, eventually, I was able to reserve one at a GameStop. I think that GameStop might still be open. Anyway, it, what ends up happening is I get the call from the employees that my PlayStation is there. And the way it had worked at the time, I guess, was that if... I didn't show up within the next day, I would get bumped back on the list and the next person in line would get the call to come and get it. So somebody else failed to pick up their PS2, so I got the call to go and get it. So I went and I did. I had, I think I had put in a deposit of like $50 or something like that, so I think it was a $300 machine. I don't remember. I think it was $300. Or maybe my deposit was like 150 What I, I don't know. But I got the damn thing, and I had blown all of my money buying... The, what am I playing here? I didn't even... <laughs> look. Some Sesame Street sports. Oh, God. It's going to suck even worse than that Olsen twins thing. Anyway, it's PlayStation 2... <laughs> Use these, these buttons. Yeah, what? Hard, hard. hard okay, ooh, fine. Ooh, I, ooh, I hope you're, hope you're ready. You're ready. Oh, the emulation is terrible. The next, the next racer, racer will be, sir, will be Grover, be Grover, Grover on his, on his <laughs> unicycle, cycle. I got the PS2, but I didn't have any money for games, so I didn't get any games, and so for the first month or two or something like that of having the PS2. It was basically a glorified PlayStation 1. I mean, not that it didn't offer anything as far as gameplay as something to use, because my PlayStation 1 was actually, like, on its last legs. I was having... I was having the disc read error problem with the PlayStation 1. I mean, it was... It was really about to die. It worked, but not all the time. So the PlayStation 2 did allow me to continue to play my PlayStation 1 games. And it did have um, some slight graphical enhancements. There was a better texture filtering solution with the PlayStation 2 while playing PS1 games. And there was, in some games anyway, as long as it didn't produce any errors, quicker loading times. So there was that, but it was the, I think it was the demo discs that I was eventually getting from the PlayStation Magazine that really gave me my first taste of PS2. And then there was the, I eventually did save up the money to buy a, buy a game, because some games, like, although it did take a while, a little while for the games to really drop into the used market, the games that were like bad <laughs> of course we're going to land on the used market first and they were going to be the ones that were the cheapest because like hey you know what no one wanted to play freaking Fantavision a lot right so that was going to end up getting turned uh, traded in well the first game I ended up buying was uh, Evergrace which was a which was a From Software the uh, Dark Souls, Demon Souls, Elden Ring people, RPG, that I remember actually being pretty excited for when I first read about it, because Next Generation Magazine had gone and done this big, like, multi-page spread about it. Um, feature about it, discussing, like, oh, well, this is the next generation of RPGs for the PlayStation 2, and then gushed about it, just frickin' gushed about it. How great it was, and how great it was going to be, and how incredible it looked, and all that kind of shit. And then within the same magazine, it had a half a page article talking about how the game wasn't any good. And it says, it even, I think, referenced, I gotta find that magazine, I think I got it somewhere. I gotta find that issue. Because I think it said something along the lines, even referencing the larger article that they had later in the magazine. It's like, like, you may have thought that this game was great given the coverage we have but it's not <laughs> but you know I was broke and 
the $20 I think I spent for it was well worth it. Of course, being broke, I didn't have a memory card. I couldn't afford a memory card. So, and that was a game that definitely needed one. What the hell am I doing here, anyway? Anyway, I didn't have a memory card. So, I would play the game with its usual from soft difficulty from the start every time and if I died there was no continues they'd reload your save which of course I didn't have having no memory card so it was a nightmare okay I'm getting out of this shit this is terrible <laughs> so I got really good at that game simply by the fact that I had no other option <laughs> Monsters, Inc. You know what? i never seen that movie. I think I've seen parts of it, but not... Not the whole movie. Oh, it's an SCEA game. Or published, anyway. Disney, Pixar. I'm not a huge fan of movie tie-in games, because ordinarily what ends up happening is the movie enters production. Even if it's something that's going to have a long lead on it, like a special effects heavy movie or something with a lot of computer animation. The decision is usually not made immediately to have a game tie-in. So, a movie production may be like a year from release when they decide we need to have a game tie-in. Well, you know what? Game releases, good ones anyway, will oftentimes take longer than that. So, you know, developers don't have a lot of time to churn it out. And the game ends up sucking. There are, of course, exceptions to this rule, like GoldenEye for the N64. Of course, GoldenEye didn't release when the movie, I think maybe it was intended to, but it got delayed. Vertex animations on this character. Look at this. I like the animations. GoldenEye released well after the movie did because developers were given time to work on it and they turned out something awesome. So, you know, this doesn't look too bad. I mean, gameplay-wise, it's boring as fuck. I haven't done anything yet. Should have listened to those instructions. I don't know what to do. <laughs> You know, I don't know what the plot of this movie is. So I don't know what this weird monster... Oh, double jump. Okay. Great, you made it. <laughs> Although this is a movie tie-in game, it's probably made on an abbreviated budget, an abbreviated time frame. Potentially limited audience. There we go. It is a late gen PlayStation 1 game. So maybe I gotta kill all those boxes. <laughs> so all the like, the, even if the developers may not have even had a lot of experience working with it. There's a large, large knowledge base of stuff, of knowledge built up of how the PlayStation 1 works and development tools that Sony would have made available to them and all the, or other developers may have had or middleware solutions or all that kind of stuff that would have made development of more advanced things on the PlayStation 1 um, better, like the vertex animations we're looking at in this character. What I'm talking about that, when I, when I say vertex animations, what I'm referring to is, like, look at the character, how his body isn't made up of a bunch of distinct parts. So, in an older PlayStation 1 game, you'd have, say, you would have the arm, so you have the hand, you have the forearm, and then you have, like, where the bicep region is. And that would be three different individual polygonal models. And they'd all be linked together with a skeleton. But you would see the joints. 
because they would just sort of clip through each other. And the entire body would be made up like that. Now, that looks fine and all, but, you know, it doesn't look that natural. It doesn't look very good. And you started to see some later games coming out, like Resident Evil 2, with its William Birkin animations as he mutated and all that kind of stuff, where you had vertex animations. Now, with vertex animations, you are probably controlling everything through bones and stuff the same way you would with this more primitive animation style. The same way, but instead of grouping like individual polygonal models together, you have one model and the distance between the vertices in the model are allowed to change. So it parts of the model at the joints stretch or shrink to allow the model to uh, animate. Now, this wasn't done early in the PlayStation 1, I guess maybe because a lot of developers didn't know how to do it. It wasn't until, like, maybe Crash Bandicoot might have been one of the first games to implement it properly. And, like, well, okay, Crash Bandicoot looks awesome. It gives you a lot of options, like the character uh, getting squished and all that kind of stuff. Which... Um, which are cool animations that you wouldn't have been able to see otherwise. But it wasn't something that I'm going to... Uh, the way that the place... The more and more I look into the way the PlayStation 1 operates, like, um, mechanically, and the way its hardware is designed and all that kind of stuff, the more I get the impression that Sony, and nobody really at the time, actually had a very firm idea into how... 3D games were going to be made and how developers were going to want to utilize the hardware and all that kind of stuff. And even then, it took still took a couple of generations for anyone to really figure it out, to get a good handle on it, and the things to start being made in a kind of a modern way. So the PlayStation 1 had mostly... It didn't have what you would call a graphics processor in the sense that you'd think of in ones nowadays. It had like a... Um, what, what is this thing? Hmm. Can't scare it, because it's a toy. I'll crush your... Alright, I don't know. <laughs> oh, I do have to do something with it. It didn't have... It had a rasterizer and all that kind of stuff. Of course it would. But all of the... All the CPU... Uh, the CPU was used for all of its... Like its... Um, 3D geometry calculations. As well as its AI and all that kind of stuff. But the CPU just really wasn't powerful enough to... Do that with any reasonable speed. So there were some... Like external semi-external modules that were built onto the machine in order to um, like a math accelerator oh okay I, I tapped this button okay A sort of like a math coprocessor built onto the package. And it was some uh, MIPS RISC design that was used for workstations or so. But Sony needed the extra math horsepower in order to push more polygons. So it. So they utilized it there. But it's. Um, there were certain limitations to the, to the design, which is why you get weird things like um, texture shimmering. Like look at that look at that that grate right there on the left side. As I move closer, the texture warps. And that has to do with the fact that that hardware acceleration, that math coprocessor, isn't capable of operating with floating point numbers. So its texture coordinate system is kind of screwy. So you notice that it's kind of got a weird crease that runs down from the bottom left to the top right. And as you get closer the because it's not slowly performing its calculations on how you should be perceiving this texture from this given angle it splits like as you get closer to it and the angle changes slightly it makes a dramatic change in the way it renders 
the texture. The way that it draws the texture. And you get this weird change. That's because of a limitation with the hardware. Where? How did I get on this? I don't even know what the... F but anyway. Uh, later consoles, of course, or the N64, in fact, didn't have this problem because they implemented floating point operations into the graphics processor. There also a few other problems associated with it. But at the time, like, you didn't really have a whole lot of understanding from developers on how 3D would be done or what the best way of doing it was. So, uh, okay, I'm getting out of this. <laughs> We're done here. So you could definitely look at this and say, like, oh, well, with modern hindsight, I can look at what the PlayStation 2 did, the PlayStation 3 or the 360 or the original Xbox or whatever, and say, you really should have just done it the way they did. Of course, more primitive, but the way they did it. But that's looking at it with hindsight and saying, yes, okay, you should have had some dedicated um, 3D processor, coprocessor to go in there that does floating point math. You should have had, like in the N64's case, you should have had more memory available for textures and all that kind of stuff. PlayStation 2, like, well, you, you should have had, even if it would have been primitive, you should have had some kind of uh, pixel level shader program programmable shaders or something in there would have been primitive but it would have been nice to have infograms it's Atari now but you can't um, you can't see the future and you can't even guarantee that it, even if you had tried using more modern concepts at the time it would have worked out the way you think it would have some Looney Tunes game God, just let me get started and fail so I can rage quit. <laughs> I guess maybe we're seeing here with the PlayStation 1 in 2002, I've seen multiple child games, kids games. Like that Olsen Twin game, the this Looney Tunes game, the Monsters, Inc. game, the, the Sesame Street game. We're looking at a lot of stuff that's intended. Now look, we... Okay, it's a little harder to tell because his character model is so skinny. But this might be using Vertex animations as well. And this doesn't look too bad either. It's not running well on the emulator, but... Being a, it's a lot of... Child games. Because that's probably who they were expecting to still be using the PlayStation 1. Okay, listen up, listen up. I'll stand wa stand watch while you you Fuck, I don't I'm not gonna listen to you. To, to start. One of the disadvantages that the PlayStation 1 had in comparison to the Nintendo 64 was that its texture filtering solution was very primitive in comparison. So he's tired. <laughs> the PlayStation 1 would have textures and they would be like you can't really see it very good here but you you do see a little bit of like a blocky chunkiness to the textures whereas the N64 had a I think it's like a trilinear texture filtering setup where the texture would be wrapped around the object and then a blurring filter would be applied to it to allow smooth transitions between the colors of the textures of course, the downside of the N64 was it had very little in the way of texture memory. And it was more of a design oversight, I want to call it. <laughs> Rather than maybe, it seems like something that maybe they could have um, overcome had they thought a little bit more about it. Or maybe it was a, like a limitation in terms of like what they were willing to pay for in terms of its design or silicon space 
But the N64 had very smooth but low detail textures. The PlayStation 1 had higher detail textures, but they were very rough because it didn't have it didn't have that trilinear texture filtering solution. It had a kind of like a, a low a kind of a cheap texture interpolation where it like doubled or quadrupled the texture resolution by simply like adding new picture picture pixels adding new pixels into the texture as it wrapped it around the object but interpolating the image upscaled a bit by taking the colors of the nearest neighbor and making a new pixel out of that now this made a texture potentially look higher resolution than it even was before but it would look chunky this game however they went for a much simpler textures where like this is more like a goard shading kind of solution here and where textures are applied they're kept pretty simple which makes this game look a little bit more n64 like than playstation like because with the n64 like people look like mario 64 looked great in its time but that was a lot of that came down to the developers designing the game around the limitations of the hardware as opposed to um i don't know what else you would say so you know okay so the n64 couldn't do high detail textures well don't try using textures with a lot of things a lot of stuff just go and um just go and put a flat color or some low resolution detail or okay i'm supposed to hide in that bush hide in the bush what's the bush god this is terrible not a lot of high res textures you can use so a lot of plain simple colors were used now the n64 also had things like um anti-aliasing solutions that the playstation didn't have and that would give the, a cleaner look but whenever you tried to have something that tried using texture detail like early n64 game like um shadows of the empire it just looked like crap all right i'm getting getting out of this so it was one of those eras where the hardware designs of the um, the hardware designs fundamentally with a lot of these consoles or all of these consoles were very different from each other which put this weird kind of solution and uh, situation forward where you can't really ever say that one console was just vastly superior to the other or better in every way like you can even add the sega saturn into this conversation sega saturn gets a lot of grape for being an inferior console to the other two like a lot of people think of it as oh the n64 was the best at 3d the playstation 2 was next uh, playstation 1 rather was the next step down and then the saturn was at the bottom of the heap well the saturn had its own advantages it was just built with a kind of a technological dead end in a certain sense when it came to the way it would render 3d graphics and stuff and its cpu wasn't it had a separate graphics processor but its cpu was a little under power to f potentially feed geometry to their graphics processor and the way that it did it was using like um four vertex quads instead of the three vertex polygons that you saw with the what the hell am I... What the hell is this thing? <laughs> that you saw with the other consoles. Plus, it, it was... Potentially have been designed with the idea of being a 2D console, not a 3D console. It's another kid's game, huh? Oh, am I supposed to get this thing over here it's got a letter on it there we go we need to find a different letter okay N. 
and just trying to be educational. How did he grab a hold of that vine? M -N -O -P -Q. Fuck does that spell? Really well. Motopaku. I did really well. I don't feel like I did really well. I'm getting out. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> Jumpstart Wildlife Safari Field Trip. Harry Potter and the Source of Osa video. Okay. You know, I never really got into the Harry Potters. I know it was uh, something that a lot of people from my generation were reading. Sort of like, oh, well, it got kids into reading books. Like, okay, I guess that was something. And the movies were popular, but they were seemed so goofy. It's gotta be a PlayStation 2 game. An ugly PlayStation 2 game. <laughs> This is stuff in the movie, isn't it? Or the... I guess this is... Shit, I don't know. It's a PlayStation 1 game. God, see what I was saying <laughs> before about how it does, these videos don't do PS2 uh, justice. It's, it was a PS1 game and I couldn't even tell. <laughs> Twisted Metal Small Brawl. You know, I, I did like Twisted Metal a lot back in the day, but there was definitely a point where I'd gotten tired of it. Especially since Twisted Metal 2 was really the last of the good ones. Was it, I, I would really like to look up the history of it, but there was a company called Single Track, which produced a lot of awesome games on the early PlayStation 1. There was, of course, Twisted Metal, there was Warhawk, there was Jet Moto, all single track games. Then something went wrong. Warhawk only had one release. Um, Jet Moto, there was a couple of, there was a few of those. Twisted Metal, there was a bunch of those. But um, single track seemed to have disappeared, and S Incog, I don't know who that is. I remember a studio called 989, which later would focus more on sports games, uh, did the later Twisted Metal games. Then there was this one here I've I don't, never heard of. But I wonder if Single Track just changed its name, or if it's just a separate studio entirely. But anyway, all of the like charm and everything out of there was just gone. There was no, no more of that for the... No more of that in the Twisted Metal. And then, like, Twisted Metal Black comes out. And I was like, hey, you know, it was alright, but I didn't really care too much. Then there was a Twisted Metal game for the PS3. I never even played it. If there's anything you can rely on to continue to be released for aging consoles, it's... Here's 989 Sports. It's sports games. And I think it's pretty clear that... Like, the last game you will ever see for any console will be a FIFA game or will be an NFL game or something like that. And I think it's really just because well after the console is gone and you still got some people that own it so will still buy these games, you can release something for a market there, but not a lot. So you're not going to get AAA releases, you're not going to get the, like, a or B releases or anything like that, but you will get the sports games because the sports games, all of the tools are already developed for it. All the development tools, all they really have to do is update the rosters. Okay, so this player was traded from this team to this team, all this other stuff happened, drafts happened, whatever. Go ahead and 
update the rosters, they can release a new version of the game. Of course, it's going to be vastly inferior to the what would then be the current generation version of the game, but you know, it doesn't really matter because you're not looking to set the world on fire with this friggin' old console. You're just churning out an updated version of the game to sell to the same customers over and over again. So I think, like, what was it? PlayStation 2, I think I had heard a uh, stat that the last PlayStation 2 game was released in, like, 2012 or something like that, and it was a FIFA game. It's like, my god, who was still buying it then? I don't know. Somebody must have, but probably not that many people because, you know, probably the last, like, three games released for the PlayStation two were all FIFA games. Doesn't look bad for a uh, PS1 game. As I've said a million times going through these demos, the late gen PlayStation 1 games definitely look worlds apart from the early PlayStation 1 games. Like, if this were an early PlayStation 1 game, all these characters would be, like, 2D sprite characters. And they would be... And they would be just animations like that. Animated sprites. This... All of these characters are 3D. Not particularly detailed. Detailed enough. But that definitely looks a lot better. Allows more freedom with the camera movement. All that kind of stuff. Oh, Jack and Dexter. Getting somewhere now. Never a huge fan of this, but I did play it. Kind of an evolution, in a sense, of the Crash Bandicoot formula on the PlayStation 1. Crash Bandicoot was, of course, very limited by the hardware constraints of the console. The PlayStation 1 had a bit of an issue when it came to um, polygon sorting. So you would have all of the, the 3D geometry of the game and the console has to determine what is able to be visible before something else. Like, is this behind this? Well, that means what's behind it shouldn't be shown in front of what's before it. As simple as that may sound, it's actually something that computers have to think about. Now, the way computers would do this is using something called a Z-buffer. Determining how far, if something is ordered further away from something that's up close, well, then you show it behind that thing. Well, the PlayStation 1 didn't have any hardware support for a Z-buffer. Now, it could be done in software, but of course, that's going to take some ticks of the CPU to use. So, Naughty Dog didn't want to spend a lot of time uh, doing uh, CPU running CPU runtime on ordering so what they did was they had a lookup table inside of the game which would uh, as the level streamed off the disk would go and know what was supposed to be behind what was sitting in front of it of course when that that means he can have very limited camera movement because the camera needs to run across a rail basically on rails so the lookup table information never became out of date so that limited what could be done with Crash Bandicoot now you're looking at the PlayStation 2 the PlayStation 2 does in fact have hardware support for a Z buffer so Naughty Dog trying to push the visuals no longer had any sort of need to put the camera on rails so that opens that up so I sort of always had the feel, always had the feeling that Jack and Daxter would have been more like what Crash Bandicoot would have been had the developers had the freedom to design the game like that. The technical um, limitations weren't there preventing them from doing it. Of course, um, Naughty Dog never owned the intellectual property for Crash Bandicoot because it was published by a different company. And that publisher went and after Crash released was like, yeah, this is ours. 
but you can keep making the games for us if you want. So Naughty Dog kept churning out Crash games for... Was it Universal that owned it? I don't know. I don't know. So this was uh, Naughty Dog. Sony ended up buying Naughty Dog at some point, although I'm not quite sure when. Maybe it might have been by this point. But this was published by Sony, so Sony was always going to own Jack and Daxter, probably. Crash games were, were made for like that gener the PS2 generation, but it was made by a different company. Uh, this is a video. Alright, so we're back where we started. So that was official US PlayStation Magazine demo disc number 52? Is it? 52. It's gotta be. January 2002. And, uh, running out of these PlayStation 1 demo discs. Still got a few sitting around. I'll get to them, but coming to an end of an era here. <laughs>